morning. So sorry for having missed yesterday. I was traveling all day, but here I am, and I'm very fortunate today to be sitting next to one of the people that I've learned so much from. You've heard me talk about uh, Rupert Spira and his book, The Nature of Consciousness. And you know, if I open it out, you'll see that uh, it's quite heavily marked. I've spoken to you about this book, uh, but uh, Rupert uh, has a new book, and uh, I just got it yesterday. Is it out yet, Rupert? It's, it will be out very soon, Okay. Uh, on Amazon. There are okay. hard copies available, but it'll be okay. out on Amazon very shortly. Very shortly. So, Rupert Spira is my guest this morning, and uh, uh, the book is called Being Aware of Being Aware, and... Uh, it's part of the Essence of Meditation series. So Rupert is here with me at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in San Jose, California. He's come all the way from England. And then actually he's coming to the Chopra Center in a week or so to teach as well. First of all, thank you for joining me this thank morning. You. Thank you. And I've been to going be through the book and as usual, you know, you're, you're so eloquent and so uh, skillful in saying so much in uh, just one sentence. So let's start with the title, Being Aware of Being Aware. Yes, being aware of being aware is really the, the essence of meditation. Uh, in, the West, in the Eastern tradition, it's known as meditation in the Western tradition, prayer. Uh, normally, we are aware of our thoughts, our feelings, sensations, perceptions, activities, relationships. And as a result, we neglect the experience of being aware. We give all our, our attention to what we are aware of, and none of our attention to that with which we are aware of our experience. Now, the common name for that with which we are aware of our experience is simply I. It is I that is listening to this conversation. It is I that am knowing my thoughts. It is I that perceives the world. So the, the name I is the name that we commonly give to the experience of being aware or awareness itself. But most of us overlook this simple presence, our, ourself, the experience of being aware in favor of what we are aware of. So Rupert, I mean, the word I is the most frequently used word amongst humans. The right? most frequently used word and the most misunderstood word. Yeah. So when I ask people, where are you, they usually say, I'm here. But what you're saying is, this is not the container of awareness, this is an experience yes. in awareness. The reason why when you ask someone, where am I, they say, I am here, is because most people believe, and more importantly feel, that I, what I essentially am, the, the experience of being aware, or awareness itself, is identical to a little cluster of thoughts and feelings called my body and my mind. But I am that which knows or am aware of my thoughts, sensations, perceptions. I am not identical to a thought, sensation or perception. So this then is the object of awareness. Yes, all, all we know of the body is a, a flow of sensations and perceptions. All sensations and perceptions come and go and they come and go in awareness and are known by awareness, but they do not themselves define awareness. Just like the, the objects in this room come and go in this room, but the room, the space of this room itself is not contained in or defined by or limited to any of the objects that appear within it. Likewise, awareness or the experience of being aware, what we essentially are, is not contained in defined by or limited to any particular thought, sensation or perception. And awareness is I. Awareness I is, is I. awareness. What I, the, the, the name I, refers to what we essentially are, awareness. We have been calling ourselves I all our lives. When, when, when you and I were five-year-old boys, we referred to ourselves as I. I am enjoying this ice cream. I am walking in the garden. I am swimming in the sea. We've been calling ourselves I all our lives. Therefore, I must refer to that which has remained present 
all our lives. We when you were a baby, when you were uh, yes, when you were a baby, you were a toddler. We can increase the volume of that. It is problem. Nice. Okay, we, so, we, we we say um, we say I had a dream last night of such and such. I slept well last night. I. Our eyes is that which remains present throughout the three states of waking, dreaming and sleeping. It has remained present all our life. Well, what element of our experience has remained consistently present throughout our life? Has any thought, sensation or perception or feeling remained present throughout our life? Obviously not. These are continuously, even since we've been sitting here for 10 minutes, we've, we've, we've all had numerous thoughts and perceptions, all of these are, are vanishing continuously, but one element they of experience, are rising, they're arising and, and subsiding, but there's one element of experience alone which remains consistently present throughout all experience, the simple experience of being aware. So, you know, a lot of people who are listening to us, watching us well, a lot of people who are listening to us, watching us right, right now, uh, they're slowly getting familiar with your mm. ideas and some of the ideas I've been talking about. And one of the things they ask is, so is awareness present in that uh, which we call deep sleep? And, you know, I came across a quote of yours here, which is very profound, um, where you say, um, let me find it, but uh, begin to answer that question. Is I, awareness I the, present in deep sleep? The quote, I, I think the quote you're looking for is, is um, something like um, deep sleep is not the Correct. absence of awareness, it is the awareness of absence. Correct. So uh, just say that once, two, three times so people actually get it. The, fra the phrase that I could come in, the, the phrase that I used, uh, awareness is deep sleep is not the absence of awareness, it is the awareness of absence. And this phrase is said in reference to the belief that most people have that in deep sleep awareness vanishes. Uh, and therefore people think that deep sleep is the absence of awareness. But in fact the experience of deep sleep, everything apart from awareness vanishes. The world, which we know through a series of perceptions, vanishes first. Then our bodily sensations vanish, then our feelings, then our thoughts, then our images. Everything in deep sleep, as we fall asleep, gradually leaves us. That, that is replaced then by the, the dream state, which in time vanishes. And in deep sleep, what is called deep sleep, it's, is the, the condition when everything has left us. All our thoughts, all our images, all our feelings, all our emotions, all our perceptions. Everything has left us apart from ourselves our essential, irreducible self, just the experience of being aware, remains all alone in deep sleep. But it is not aware of anything, because there is nothing in itself, other than itself, which it could be aware of. If you imagine, let me give you an analogy, if you imagine the space of this room was aware, so that it's not an inert physical space, imagine that the space of this room was aware, and it was aware of all the objects in this room. Now imagine removing all the objects one by one. What would remain would just be the aware space. But there would be nothing for that aware space to be aware of other than itself because the room had been emptied of objects. So there is just this aware space. Now deep sleep is, is this knowing presence or presence of awareness just all alone. And the reason that it is peaceful is because there is nothing in it other than itself, with which it could be disturbed. And the reason deep sleep is experienced as timeless and spaceless is because in the absence of thought and perception, there is no experience of time or space. The experience of time or space come into apparent existence with the appearance of thought and perception. So in the absence of thought and perception, the experience is timeless and spaceless, which is why when we wake up in the morning, we have the experience, we have the knowledge, I slept well. That knowledge comes from an actual experience. We were present all alone, peacefully resting in our own being during deep sleep. But there was no experience of time or space there because there was no thought or perception there. So people identify themselves so much with the experience 
yes. that they overlook who is or what is having the experience. We pay exclusive attention to what we are aware of, of. and we neglect the experience of being aware. Now, when I say, I'd just like to clarify this, when I say we pay attention to the experience, to, to the objects that we are aware of, and we neglect the experience of being aware, I don't mean to suggest that we are one thing and the experience of being aware is another thing. We are the experience of being aware. We are awareness. So we could say that awareness loses itself in the objective content of its experience. It loses itself in thinking and feeling and listening and it acting. It hides itself. It, it hides itself. Veils itself. It veils itself, but it veils itself with its own activity. Because thinking, feeling, sensing and perceiving are not objects or entities in their own right. They are the activity of consciousness. So it's like an actor losing himself in the part that he is playing. The part, it's like an actor called John Smith who loses himself in the character of King Lear. King Lear is not an, an entity in his own right. King Lear is the activity of John Smith, but John Smith loses himself in the, in the part of King Lear and as a result suffers. He's not suffering because of his relationship with his daughters. He's suffering because he has forgotten, I am John Smith. So, you know, in the Vedantic traditions, they say that which cannot be seen, but without which there is no seeing, that which cannot be perceived, yes. etc. And what you have said a little while ago, space-time are actually, in a sense, um, experiences, but awareness has no form. So, having no form, Obviously, it's not in space-time. It has no dimension, and therefore, yes. it's in a sense eternal, timeless, right? Uh, yes, uh, awareness, uh, as you rightly say, it has no forms in it. Therefore, it has no uh, dimensions. Awareness is, is dimensionless. It's not possible for us to think of this. Don't try to. It's think. inconceivable. It's not inconceivable or perceivable. No, the, uh, the mind imposes its own limitations on everything that it thinks or perceives. Therefore the mind cannot think about awareness because awareness has no objective qualities. There's nothing there for the mind to think about. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't really, we can't imagine or visualize dimensionless consciousness. Okay. However, it's, when I say dimensionless consciousness, means that means consciousness or awareness that has no, it has no dimensions, it has no finite qualities. It is infinite. Mm -hmm. Infinite doesn't mean extended indefinitely this in all directions. Is. It means it has no dimensions. dimensions. But what it, th this awareness that has no dimensions, it's not an abstract, mystical realm. It is the very awareness in which our current experience is taking place and with which our current experience is known and in fact out of which our current experience is, is made. It means that all of this is dimensionless or infinite consciousness refracted through the prism of the mind's activity. Which is its own creation. Which is its own activity. Mm -hmm. So it is awareness itself that assume, assumes the form of thinking mm -hmm. and its eternal nature as a result appears as time. It is awareness itself that assumes the form of perception and its infinite nature as, appears to itself as space. In other words, time and space are what the eternal, infinite nature of consciousness looks like when refracted through the prism of thought and perception. You have addressed a lot of very um, important questions, not only in this book, but your other book, which, as I said, I've been talking about here on Facebook. And so people want to know, why is this important? Uh, because, you know, we, we have these fears of uh, getting old, death, um, uh, what happens to us after we die, and you're saying these are constructs uh, which are based on non-reality in yes. a sense. Why is this important? Very simply, because everybody seeks one thing alone. Happiness. Happiness. None of your viewers would be watching this, this program if the world if objective experience had satisfied their desire for happiness. In fact, everybody who is watching this conversation is watching it precisely because they have been failed. The objective experience, activities, relationships, substances, states of mind, have 
failed them sufficiently often, has failed to produce happiness sufficiently often. And so uh, th th this, this non-dual understanding, uh, in whatever form or whatever tradition that it arises in, really tells us one thing alone, that the, the source of happiness, the source, the place where peace resides, the place where happiness resides, is not in the acquisition of any experience, a, a, a relationship, an activity, a, a, a substance, it, that, that our own essential nature, the essence of each of our minds, is itself the experience of peace or happiness. I've heard you say that when you see yourself in another, that experiences love, when you see yourself in an object, that experiences beauty. Um, yes. Please. Yes. That, that, that's... That, that's that's very true. If, let's say you and I were to now describe, if we were both to write down on a piece of paper, our current thoughts, feelings, sensations, perceptions, we would, our two lists would be different. They would be similar uh, because we, we think alike, but, but nevertheless the objective content of our experience would be different. And everybody, if everyone watching this now were to write a list of whatever they were thinking feeling or perceiving, each of our lists would be different. However, if each of us were to turn around the other way and ask the question, but what is it that knows our thoughts? What is it that knows our feelings and sensations? What is it that knows our perceptions? In other words, what is it that each of us calls I? And we were each to try to describe that as best we could. We would all describe exactly the same experience. In other words, in spite of the fact that the content of our minds may be different and indeed are different, the essence of each of our minds, in other words, the essence of each of ourselves, is the same unlimited self-aware being. Now, how many unlimited awarenesses can there be? There cannot be even two, let alone seven billion, because even if there were two, each one would have to be limited. Therefore, the non-dual teaching suggests that the the simple experience of being aware, not some extraordinary mystical state, but the simple experience of being aware that everybody has, that everybody intimately knows, is the same shared awareness refracting itself in each of our minds as the simple knowledge, I am, I am aware. Now, and, and, and that, that experience, that experience of our shared being is the experience of love. Now, we are already good friends, but imagine if we were to take two people, and let's take uh, an extreme. Let's take uh, Donald Trump and the North Korean leader, King Jong-un. Jong -un. Let's take those. Let's say we, they were both sitting here and they were willing to participate in this experiment, and we asked them both to describe their thoughts and feelings. Unlike our thoughts and feelings, which are similar, Theirs would be diametrically Actually, opposed. Similar. <laughs> you're, you're right, they're also similar, but, but you're, you're quite right. Yeah. But, but they, they would describe that there would be a hatred and enmity yes. between them. But if we ask them, but what are you behind your thoughts and feelings? Your thoughts and feelings, you haven't always had these thoughts. If, if we were to encourage both of them, Go back, trace your experience as far back in yourself as you can. Ask yourself the question, but what is it that knows or is aware of these thoughts and feelings? As long as both of them were able to and willing to conduct the experiment, sooner or later they would both get back to the same experience, the same essential, so inherently peaceful, unconditionally fulfilled sense of simply being aware. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that at, at, the, at the deepest level, these two adversaries are the same. In other words, they love each other. That, that, in other words, the, 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 the resolution of their conflict will never be found in some future meeting of minds. Their minds will never meet. If so, this is in, uh, in because answer, their minds are just because their minds are going to go on and on, producing the same right. kind of. Uh, uh, but but if they were to to pause and trace their experience back in the other direction, at sooner or later, they would come to 
the recognition of their shared being. And that recognition, the common name for which is love, is the source not only of peace and happiness in ourselves, but it is the source, in fact the only source of world peace. It is our only hope for world peace, is that our leaders will not to try to make alliances. They have to they, awaken they will be to fragile alliances at best. They have to go in the other direction and understand and feel that beneath all their divisive thoughts and feelings they are the, not the, a similar being. They are the same being and that is the experience of love when we recognize our shared being. Okay. Now last night uh, we were by the elevator we had a short conversation um, about time and uh, of course um, that experience is gone now. Uh, we can only think of it as what people call a memory which is a thought now. Talk to me a little bit about why it's important to understand that time is another construct because if we as awareness are timeless beings then we are not subject to birth and death and you know as you know in the Vedanta the five kleshas not knowing the true nature of reality and then grasping, clinging, being afraid, yes. identifying with the ego, the fear of death, yes. all the, these are the, yes. solvable. Yes, the, these two essential conditions of uh, of the, the separate self or the human being, the, the fear of death and the, the need for fulfillment, uh, grasping. Um, where do they come from? The fear of death comes from the feeling, I am going to disappear. The, the sense of lack or the desire for happiness comes from the feeling, I am incomplete. So the separate self, the finite mind, the person that most of us think we are, essentially fears death or fears non-existence and feels a sense of lack and is always trying to fulfill that sense of lack through the acquisition of objects, substances, relationships, etc. <laughs> However, if we were to ask awareness, not ask the finite mind, not, not ask our, our thoughts and feelings, but if we were to ask awareness itself, do you, what is your experience of yourself? Because after all, awareness is the only one that is aware of being aware. If we were to ask awareness, what is your experience of yourself? Have you ever experienced yourself disappearing? Have I, awareness, ever had the experience of my own disappearance? Awareness would simply say no. In my own experience of myself, I am ever present. If we, if we ask awareness, did you ever experience yourself appearing? Awareness would say no. There is the experience of the body appearing. Our thoughts appear, our sensations appear and disappear, but that in which they, dis they appear and disappear, itself never appears or disappears. So yesterday, that which I call Deepak, um, traveled from New York to San Francisco in a plane, awareness did not travel, right? No, what, what, what you call Deepak in this limited sense is a flow of sensations and perceptions. As is the jet plane, as is... Which, which is a combination of the, the jet plane, the sky, your body. This flow and, of, and New York City. And, and New York San City, Francisco. the entire world is a yeah. flow of sensations and perceptions. These flowed through awareness, mm -hmm. but awareness didn't go anywhere. That's right. Awareness never goes anywhere. But there, there is no... From awareness's point of view, there is no space present in which it could, through which it could travel. It is always, it is not always in the same place. It is, it is not in space. It's not. It, it is not. It is not in time. It is eternally. Eternal means it doesn't mean lasting forever mm -hmm. in times. It means literally not, not in, in time. time. It is eternally present. And and now it's not it a is, moment in time. Then. Now is the yes. Now is the common name we give for eternity. Of course, the mind misunderstands that and think that thinks that the now is a, a point that is moving slowly along a line of time. But now is not a point and in time. And we've never actually experienced a moment in time appear and then disappear, well, followed by another moment in time. No, it's very, if, if we ask ourselves, have we? Everybody can think of the past and the future, but can anybody? just for a moment, leave the now and visit the place we refer to as the past. Has anybody ever left the now and gone to this place called the past or indeed the future? N nobody's ever been there. 
nobody could ever go there. So we, we should be scrupulously scientific about this and, and subject our theories to the scrutiny of our experience. Experience must be the test of reality. If nobody's ever gone there, if, no, if nobody's ever visited the place called the past, what evidence is there for this place? Could it be that the past is just what eternity looks like when it is refracted through the limitations of the mind? Rupert, I, I hang out with brothers and sisters like you, but I also hang out <laughs> in another completely yes. physicalist world which says that the brain is the source of awareness and uh, matter is the ultimate reality. Uh, I want you to address these two points because the brain itself is an experience, isn't it? Yes. The, the, the people that say that the brain is the source of awareness, they do not realize how deeply enmeshed they are within a certain belief system. They, they are so profoundly enmeshed in that paradigm. The brain is a word for another perceptual experience. The, 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 the brain is, a, is a, 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 occasionally a, a sensation if you have a headache and occasionally a perception if you're a brain surgeon. But, but sensations are, in other words, our only knowledge of the brain. And by the way, the headache is also not in the brain, it's well, the, the meninges or whatever. The, the brain the, the, has no experience whatsoever the, the, of itself. The brain, the body, the, the world are a flow of sensations and perceptions that appear in consciousness. Uh, and th there, is, there is no evidence. People have been looking for consciousness in the brain for decades now. Nobody's ever found it. Nobody will ever find it. It's not there. The brain is always a perception in consciousness. <clears throat> so um, recently uh, there was a brilliant TED talk by this neuroscientist from England. Uh, he's ethnically Indian, but you know when you speak to him he's more or when you listen to him, he's more British than you are. His name is Anil Seth, and uh, his uh, TED Talk caught fire a bit. It was very well done. But what he said in that TED Talk is that what we call the world is a controlled hallucination of the brain. So the question <coughs> that, of course, occurred to me is um, if every perception is a controlled hallucination or a hallucination, then the brain must be a hallucination too. Of, of Are course. you using it, a hallucination it, so, to explain a hallucination? It's so obvious. It, 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 you're right. I mean, this man is obviously a highly intelligent yes, man, yes. and yet he's, he's made the simplest error. If he thinks that all the world and everything that in it is a hallucination, then the brain must be a hallucination as, as well. I also um, listened, I haven't heard the TED talk that you referred to, but I listened also recently to another TED talk by a very well-known philosopher, a uh, highly respected philosopher on the nature of consciousness, and he pointed out, he said, all of this is uh, like a, a movie. Everything you experience is a movie taking place in your head. But the head is also the part head of the movie. must be part of the movie. You're right. It, it, why, why is it not possible for these highly intelligent people to see that if you say all of this is taking place in the head, is the head somehow a, 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 a kind of floating, a little floating sphere that is somehow at taking at outside the movie? And in, in, in what space does the head exist if it's not existing? You know, but it, it's so contradictory. All and, of today's science is based on what. I've been calling for a long time the superstition of matter because you know it's successful science is successful we we all both took a plane to yeah. get here we're talking to people through mm -hmm. the internet um, we uh, surf the information highway uh, we make calls we send emails yeah. it's very successful as a model right yes but it's based on the understanding that there's a fundamental thing called physical matter. Right. But the, the, the intuition of science, it, that there is a fundamental thing, is correct. It, it's a true intuition. 
it's just that, in other words, scientists like you and I, like everybody, have this deep intuition. There is a single reality. Scientists call that single reality matter. You and I call that single Conscious reality the, consciousness or awareness. What is the difference between you and I and the scientists? And in, in that you and I just simply follow the evidence of our experience. Whereas the scientists have to invent a substance that well, appears outside consciousness called matter, which nobody has ever found or could ever find. And then they believe that that invented substance called matter gives rise to all that is actually ever experienced, which is consciousness. So hold on to that thought that scientists invent a substance called matter based on an experience of basically sensations, images, perceptions, thoughts, etc. And then based on that, there's an interpretation of this substance called matter, which, as you said, uh, no one has ever discovered, right? Yes, which doesn't mean to say that, that all of this is unreal. It's, it's very real, but its reality is not made out of dead inert stuff called matter. Its reality is consciousness. C can I give you a, 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 a simple analogy for this? When we fall asleep at night, we, we dream a, a, a dreamed world, but our sleeping mind cannot know that dreamed world directly. In order to know the dreamed world, our mind must forget that it's dreaming, and it must enter into its own imagination, enter into its own dream, and collapse or <laughs> contract into a separate subject of experience in the dream from whose point of view the dreamed world is known. In other words, our own mind, in order to bring about the dreamed world, our own mind has to divide itself in two. A multiplicity and diversity of objects made out of stuff called matter, and a separate subject of experience made out of stuff called mind, from whose perspective this world of objects is known. In other words, the... Uh, uh, the, the, the our mind divides itself into these two apparent dreams was, an ex was appeared in and made of and known by the single, unlimited, um, indivisible and realm that which of I our got own this mind. And all that was just so one thing. So from the point of view of the separate subject of experience in the dream, what was out there was something separate from itself, made out of something other than itself. That's called matter. In other words, matter, it, 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 staying with the dream analogy, I'll extrapolate it in a minute, staying with the dream analogy, matter, that is the stuff out of which the dreamed world is, is made, is really what the inside of our own mind looks like mm. from the perspective of the dreamed subject. Correct. Now, could it be that each of our minds are dreams in the mind of infinite consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that therefore, the only difference between our individual minds and uh, consciousness is that our individual minds dream in succession, one dream at a time. Mm -hmm. Whereas infinite consciousness, I would suggest, can dream numerous dreams, and each of our minds are a simultaneous dream. Or, uh, uh, precipitation within the mind of infinite consciousness, through the agency of which consciousness knows the inside of its own mind like when viewed through the lens of the finite mind. So, uh, yeah, you can ignore that or just uh, call off. So, um, hold on for 15 seconds. We have to take a, uh, in sure. my Facebook, yeah. uh, we okay. have to take a 15 second okay. commercial break. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but can you just press that where it's, 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 there's a button for the ad, which looks as the ad. And uh, I can do it. Okay, <laughs> so here we go for 15. Uh, other humans called Deepak is back. And um, uh, as we were taking this small break, I was uh, reminded of this um, quote by Wittgenstein, who says, uh, we are asleep, our life is a dream, uh, but once in a while we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. Um, 
your book, um, Being Aware of Being Aware, which I'm thoroughly enjoying. Uh, you know, you think a slim volume like this, but every sentence over there is worth a conversation. So your book, uh, Being Aware of Being Aware, is literally about waking up or what uh, the wisdom traditions call enlightenment, for lack of a better word. Why is it important for us to wake up right now? Because I don't think it's a dream anymore. It's become a nightmare. The world because, is, because is to, downgraded to, the dream yes, to a nightmare. To, to, to recognize the essential nature of ourselves is both the source of peace and happiness mm -hmm. in ourselves. It is, it is also the source of the resolution of conflicts between individuals, communities and nations. And, and religions. It, and religions. And it is therefore, it is, it is our only hope for world peace. A any other peace that is built, built on any other knowledge, uh, knowledge uh, apart from the knowledge of our shared being, is at best a, a fragile alliance. Uh, by the way, uh, if you're enjoying this, can you press the like button and can you also share this conversation with others? Because unless we expand this conversation, um, that critical mass of awakening is not going to happen. If you want a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthy world, then please, um, I'm being very practical here, like the button and share this conversation. Uh, will you do that for me, please? Right now, press the like button and share. And um, so, Rupert, you uh, call this uh, chapter five, the effortless path. Explain that. Why is awakening effortless? Because awakening is our self's awakening to itself. So although we speak of this investigation as a journey that we make from what we think we are to what we really are, in fact, there is no real distance from ourself. Journey ourself. without distance. If I, were able, if I were to ask you, Deepak, now stand up and take a step towards yourself. Impossible. How much effort would you have to make to stand as yourself? Yes. So, the, the, the self that we seem to be, the person with all its thoughts and feelings, is really the true and only self of unlimited, ever-present awareness, with an imaginary limit attached to it. It's not as if, it's not that, as if uh, the, the, the separate self is one thing and our true self is another thing. There, there is only one self, if we can call it a self, the true and only self of ever-present unlimited awareness and, and the, the separate self is simply an imaginary limitation. All that is necessary is to, for, for, for those limits to, to fall away and our true self to stand revealed. It's not created, it's not a new experience that we discover in the future. It is, it is the, the word revelation means the laying bare of it. It is the laying bare of what we, we always and already are but we have failed to notice because it has become mixed with thoughts and feelings. You say awareness cannot be discovered, it can only be recognized. Yes. You just said that. Yes, yes. It, it reveals it, itself. It, it, it can only recognize itself. Um, when, when John Smith has lost himself in the part of King Lear, and as a result he's miserable, King Lear begins to explore his experience and at a certain point there is this recognition I am John Smith the, the knowledge I am John Smith is not some marvellous new experience that, that John Smith has that's always his experience but his experience was his experience of himself was mixed with King Lear's thoughts and feelings and as a result he overlooked himself he forgot himself he ignored himself and in fact this is the meaning of the word ignorance in the Vedantic tradition. It doesn't mean stupidity. It's not a derogatory term. It means the ignoring of what we already and essentially are in favor of our thoughts and feelings. You know, the other day I was <clears throat> in a debate with Michael Shermer, who's the, you know, the ep epitome of 
physicalism, materialism, atheism, and uh, of course this was at a YouTube uh, uh, event, and uh, we're friends by the way, even though we don't agree with each other, and um, I happened to make the statement in another context that all knowledge, uh, so-called knowledge, is ignorance. And uh, people, of course, uh, ridiculed that statement. But what you're calling ignorance is ignoring the reality for the appearances of reality, right? Yes. Uh, Rumi, the, the, the Sufi mystic that many people know, said, said a similar thing. He meant knowledge of the world is a kind of ignorance. Okay. Now, th th this was not... The object's camouflage. Yes, it, it was not a statement. It was not a life-denying statement. statement. It was saying knowledge of the world as it is conventionally considered to be. In other words, knowledge of, of a world made out of dead, inert stuff called matter. In order to know such a world, we have to ignore its reality infinite alive consciousness which in religious language in his terminology is called God's infinite being. being. That's the religious name for it. Consciousness is the, the scientific or the mystical name for it but the common name for it is I. See all relative knowledge and experience are derived from and are a reflection of the single non-dual absolute knowledge just as the apparent multiplicity and diversity of the objects and people in a night dream are refractions of a single indivisible mind. Yes, exactly. exactly. So the, 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 oh, just, just to, to mm -hmm. add to that, but the, the only absolutely true knowledge there is, the only knowledge that, is, that remains the same for all people at all times, in all places, in all states, under all circumstances, is the simple knowledge, the experience of being aware, which shines in each of our minds as the knowledge I am. The, the, the knowledge I am is the same for everybody, for the Buddha, for Donald Trump, for you and I, for, 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 for everybody. Everybody's thoughts and feelings are different, but the, everybody's essential self, the self this feeling of being which shines in everybody's experience as the simple knowledge, I am. That is the same for everyone. It is the place, if we can call it a place, where humanity are one. And that recognition is not only the source of peace in each of us, it is the basis of world peace, peace amongst communities, and nations and families. I'll end with this uh, statement, but I'll have you explain it. Um, you say, nothing ever happens to awareness. Now, the reason I'm reading that is, um, obviously, awareness is not subject to birth or death, right? Yes. So what is that which people call physical death? Well, can, can the can dissolution I, can, of the so-called can, can I just mm -hmm. comment on the first, mm -hmm. uh, the, fir the first statement that you made, nothing ever happens to awareness, because that, to make sure that this isn't people don't feel that we're kind of speculating about some uh, philosophical, mystical... Uh, nothing ever happens to awareness or being aware. For instance, imagine being a five-year-old boy. And instead of turning your attention towards what you were aware of, for your parents' garden, the beach, uh, the taste of your meal, you were to turn your attention to the simple experience of being aware. And then you were to do the same when you were ten years old and 20 years old, and 30, 40, 50, etc. The experience of being aware is always the same experience. Has no age. What we are aware of is always changing. But the experience of being aware, which is our essential self, is always the same. It means that nothing has ever happened to us. No experience, however awful or painful it may have been, no experience has ever tarnished us, or harmed us, or diminished us, or aged us. We are always this, this pristine, inherently peaceful, open, empty, self-knowing presence of awareness that doesn't age, it is never tarnished by experience, it is never aggrandized by experience, it doesn't come or go, it wasn't born, and it doesn't die. So what is that which everyday people call physical death? It's just that 
It's just the quiet sense of the excitations of awareness. E exactly, the excitations in deep sleep. Absolutely, the excitations of awareness, what we call mind or experience, that is thinking, feeling, sensing, or perceiving. They, they, it's the, the, the quiescence, the, the, the dissolving away of that. And the body, remember from this point of view, the mind is not something contained in the body. The body is a flow of uh, sensing, Perceptions. hearing, touching, tasting, sensing, but perceiving. So uh, what is called physical death is the dissolution of mind in consciousness, the dissolution of sensing and perceiving. Settling down. But yes, the settling down of the excitations, the, uh, the vibrations now, you of know, mind. In, in many religions, there's a talk of reincarnation and some soul is uh, recycling again as a new experience. Yes. Um, I think people need to understand that what maybe recycles are patterns of uh, experience, uh, perhaps uh, that recycle the, what we call sanskaras, vasanas in Sanskrit. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Is there yes. a possibility of yes. that uh, absolutely. ongoing continuity of, yes. Uh, of yes. the essence of life? Take, let's take as an analogy to begin with what happens when we fall asleep at night. When we fall asleep at night, our body and the world that is perceived by our body vanishes. But we don't go immediately into a state of deep sleep. Mm -hmm. We pass through a dream state in which the residues from the waking state are left over and they, uh, 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 they become the, the, uh, our dreamed world. In other words, the, the, the leftover energies from Good. the waking state take the shape of our of our dream state and there's nothing so uh, falling asleep in this analogy is, is analogous to to death there's nothing to suggest that the energies of mind that coalesce into the form of our bodies during this lifetime don't remain in consciousness after the dissolution of the and have the potential physical, therefore and have to the re-express to, to gather again uh, our friend um, Bernardo uh, Castro, if I could borrow his analogy, because it, the world, uh, uh, yes, the, imagine uh, the river. The, the water in the river is consciousness. That the that the, the waves are, are vibrations in in consciousness, and and the the, the the currents that some of them gather together and form worm, form form whirlpools. They 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 they, they, they gather together into a into a, a center, a location. So each of our minds, each of our, uh, each of our selves, uh, is like a whirlpool. Now when that whirlpool dissolves, the energies that go into the make of it disband into the river, but they don't necessarily disappear. They just lose their form as a whirlpool, but they remain as currents or eddies in the river. The, so that's the energies left over from the whirlpool remain uh, unlocated in the river and later on there's nothing to suggest that those residues that are left over from a previous whirlpool may not gather together again and form the basis of a new whirlpool and the energies that go into the make of the new whirlpool are left over energies from the old whirlpool and this would be a theory of, of reincarnation that doesn't uh, um, doesn't believe in a reincarnating self because the only self is the all that's there is water it's all water, water. it's Whether all it's consciousness and the, the, the separate self the finite mind is is a is, is a, a coalescing uh, of, of consciousness a localization of consciousness so each and, and each of our bodies is what that localization looks like when viewed from the point of view of another mind but even so although we seem to be looking at physical bodies what we are really looking at are localizations in consciousness and when those localizations in consciousness disband they flow out into the broader medium of consciousness and may if there are leftover energies from the, the from this lifetime there's nothing to suggest those energies may not f form the nucleus of, of, of another located form of awareness which would appear as another body. Thank you Rupert and I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I will make sure to that it, 
is there on I think it's in, available in on, on Amazon space. Space. Uh, this book is yes. available on Amazon being aware of being aware pick it up and uh, if you don't I'll keep reminding you anyway <laughs> but uh, thanks Rupert thank you Deepak as always thanks. this thank is you. wonderful thank you